Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the wonderful opportunity to welcome back to JBS a dear friend and one of the most courageous voices on the world you were seeing today, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States and the former deputy foreign minister of the state of Israel, Danny Ayalon, who now is a journalist, commentator, teacher, who writes for Israeli and international newspapers such as the Jerusalem Post, the Wall Street Journal, and Danny is also a visiting professor of foreign policy at Yeshiva University and Stern College. How wonderful it is to have you back at this table. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well. Always a pri privilege to be here with Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's the mood in Israel these days? As you come here this time, when you left, what's the mood? What are Israelis concerned about today? Well, there is a, a grave concern, mostly about the geopolitics. Quite interestingly, Mark, the Israeli economy is going very well. You mm -hmm. know, Israel today uh, is one of the strongest economies in the world in terms of growth, in terms of um, employment, you know, full employment, in terms of wealth, in terms of construction, and our high-tech industry continues to really roll ahead, full steam. And this is before mentioning the uh, natural gas reserves, mm -hmm. these huge amounts that we found offshore in the Mediterranean. So as far as the economics, we, we, we are doing well. But the geopolitics, you see, we look at the world around us, which right, is I'm, falling apart. We're going apart. to come to geopolitics in one moment. I just want you to finish the economics first. What we often hear is that, sadly, there is, as is true in America, an income gap. Yes. And yes. that the gap is very wide, wider than we would like it to be, and that it hurts those at the lower end. And so if you're doing well in Israel, life is wonderful. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing well, or if you're not in the upper strata, it's very hard to buy an apartment, yep. rent an apartment, to have a home. And life is hard. To what extent, Danny, is that accurate? Well, it is, uh, and, and I guess it comes with uh, progress, it comes with um, a, a post-industrial uh, economy, mm -hmm. and, and certainly the gaps are, are growing wide. Um, if you're not in the center of things, if you're not in the high tech, or if you're not in a growing uh, uh, economic uh, field, yes, you are falling behind. Mm -hmm. And the, the gaps are, you know, just like in, the United, like in any just industrial like, right. country. Mm -hmm. And this is a real challenge for the government. Um, the periphery, you know, is very, very important for Israel from a strategic point of view, from a demographic point of view. You know, the, the Negev, for instance. The Negev is, makes 60% of the land mass of Israel, yet only 9% of the population lives there. Most of us live, you know, we, we say between Hedera and Gedera, you know, which is a, north, a little bit north of Tel Aviv, a little bit south of Tel Aviv. And, and this is not good. Um, and this is a challenge for the government to do. Uh, first of all, with the infrastructure, you know, have roads. So the road from Tel Aviv to Be'er Sheva will, will take uh, not two hours, but one hour, mm -hmm. or to Haifa, or mm -hmm. even to Eilat. And secondly, to create jobs in the periphery. This is, uh, and, and I guess it's something that uh, the government is uh, very much uh, Are you mindful hopeful? Uh, oh, very much so. Very much so. I'm very hopeful. I think that... Uh, um, in absolute terms, I think the, the Jewish state has really made a, an enormous progress and an enormous change for Jewish destiny, for Jewish lives, not just in Israel, but all over. And in relative terms, the gaps, mm -hmm. the strategic gaps mm -hmm. between Israel and any potential enemy or a coalition of enemies is growing. And... Uh, the threats are not diminishing, but we have ways to defend ourselves. Okay. Come to the geopolitical then in okay. more detail. You say that that's where Israelis are concerned. Why? 
Well, we see the world changing, and uh, certainly in the Middle East it's going up in flames. Uh, there is a process of disintegration, political disintegration, which I believe is only in the beginning. We're not even at the end of the beginning of this mm -hmm, process. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, we will find ourselves um, in not uh, too distant uh, of a future with not 22 entities, 22 Arab countries, but maybe as many as 30 or more. Syria will never be glued together. And then you look at Syria, it's made out of four or five different ethnicities mm -hmm. and, and, and political groups. Iraq, de facto, is made out of three different uh, entities, you know, the Kurds, the Shias, and the, and the Sunnah. Libya, same thing. Lebanon may, uh, you know, Le Lebanon is the mirror image of, of Syria. So I, I, I really am concerned about stability over there. And threats of um, Islamic radicalism in Jordan, in Egypt, Gulf countries, and of course, overall this, you have Iran, which is, I believe, the um, by far the most uh, danger, dangerous um, phenomenon, not just for Israel and the Middle East, but much beyond. So you don't feel that the deal that was made helped the world vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, I would say the jury is still out. Uh, Iranians, near as I can tell, are pretty much abiding to the letter of this agreement in uh, Vienna, but certainly not to the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where, and, and I think we discussed it here, Mark, more than once, this is where I was so much against the deal because it didn't look into the full picture. Mm -hmm. For instance, Iran today is redoubling their efforts on delivery systems. Now, you don't build and, and invest billions of dollars on delivery systems if you don't want to put a, a uh, significant uh, uh, Warhead. warhead, and that means non-conventional warhead. Uh, they continue to uh, promote, inspire, finance um, terrorism all over, and they also are very much in the process of the disintegration of the of the Middle East, uh, Shia versus uh, uh, Sunnah, and uh, and this is why uh, I think that we need to look more carefully into the situation and hopefully we will have a leader of the uh, Western world and it can only be the United States. Mm -hmm. It can only be the United States. There is no substitute to the United States leadership for morally and also uh, politically, strategically. And they will have to look into this um, agreement again and I would say try to, to change it and extend it over to terrorism counterterrorism and also to deli delivery systems and to make sure that, you know, to hold the Iranians' feet into the fire and make sure that they will not breach not only the, the agreement on, uh, on the fissile materials, but everything around Very it. interesting. You know that terrorism was never discussed as part of the deal. And for some reason, the deal did give Iran the right to do to build a more intercontinental ballistic system. Yes. That was part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, and I never could understand why that was true. The argument was it was, the, it was necessary to make the deal. And at the time, and we did discuss it, the argument always was it's better than any alternative. It's not the best, but it's better than any alternative. Has anything happened to make, to convince you that that is true? Even though it's not a good deal, it's better than any alternative. No, because I think the right alternative uh, was to make sure that Iran will dismantle completely their nuclear infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's just an hiatus, just a um, suspension. And the fact that Iran was on the verge of collapse, economic collapse, which would naturally lead into political collapse, they did not have too many cards to play with. Mm -hmm. And who were they facing? They were facing the entire international community. The P5 plus 6, the United States, the major countries in the world. Okay, so out of respect, they treated Iran as, as equal, which is fine when it comes to the demeanor, to the packaging. But when it comes to content, this was a missed opportunity because this was the time to really drive a good bargain, and this was not 
done. Now, I asked you what are Israelis concerned about. You said the geopolitical scene. Are you telling me that Israelis have anxiety about what's going to happen as the Arab world seems to right now be in chaos? Well, we see a spillover. Uh, we are pretty much surrounded by um, Islamist extremism. We have a uh, spillover in the Golan Heights from Jabhat al-Nusra and uh, an offshoot of, um, of Al-Qaeda. Sinai is pretty much a no-man land and uh, ISIS is, is taking over there. Hamas, Hezbollah. ISIS is in the Sinai? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and trying also to infiltrate into uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, trying to infiltrate into uh, Gaza. And, uh, and there is no, right now, there is no real country or force that can keep them in check. And Israel can't do it itself. Well, we can defend ourselves, but certainly we cannot go and infringe upon other countries' uh, sovereignty. Uh, so whatever we, we need to do, we do in terms of uh, intelligence, in terms of sharing information, in terms of um, other things that, you know, matter not elaborate about. But uh, at the end of, of the day, it's each country's responsibility. And they certainly would need the help of the United States, mm -hmm. the help of the West. Uh, otherwise, uh, we see the mischief done by Russia, Turkey, uh, which uh, does not help the situation. You know, there's the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The one country you did not mention as you went through the, the litany of the Arab world was Saudi Arabia. And we've heard that there has been a rapprochement of sorts between Israel and Saudi Arabia, which at one point was unthinkable. I want to know from you, and again, people must remember, you were deputy foreign minister. You were dealing with other nations all the time. How do you feel about Saudi Arabia right now? And I ask that in the context of, mm -hmm. at one point we were told they were the biggest sponsor of state terrorism all throughout the world, that the people who flew planes into the World Trade Center, right. were trained in Saudi Arabia, and that it was hard to really feel that Saudi Arabia was, was a friend either of the United States and certainly of Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me where Israel stands now vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. And you know, if you were still in the foreign ministry, what would your attitude hmm. be? Well, I can tell you when I was in the foreign ministry, and this is not a secret, um, I, I, maybe I was the first Israeli official that shook hand on camera, for the record, with a senior uh, Saudi official, uh, Faisal of Turkey, which was the head of their intelligence. Uh, this was in uh, Munich, I believe it was in 2011, uh, in a conference in, uh, in, in Munich. And maybe that was the harbinger of what was going on uh, uh, today. Certainly there is a convergence of interest now between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis even ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, it's ironic in a way. It is ironic, it? absolutely. Uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's part of the shifting sands in, in, in the Middle East. And uh, things will continue to change. But certainly at this point, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, the Gulf countries, Egypt, Jordan, all these countries have a great stake in cooperation with Israel. Mm -hmm. Some over you know, over the, the table and some under, under the radar. And, uh, but certainly there is a lot of uh, things going on. Okay. So we've talked about this before. For American Jewry, when American Jews get together and talk about Israel, the first thing they talk about is the peace. It, can there be a peaceful resolution yeah. of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Will there be a two-state solution? If there's no two-state solution, what in the world is Israel going to do? That is the, the preeminent overriding concern of American Jews when they first start talking about Israel. Is that true for Israelis? Are Israelis as consumed with the question of how do we deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as American Jews are? I'm not sure, Mark. Quite frankly, I'm not sure. Certainly there is the political divide between left and right in Israel, and uh, I would say the salient point 
uh, of difference between right and left in Israel is the Palestinian conflict or the Palestinian problem. Uh, but Define for me. The left says what, the right says what? Well, I, I would say the left, by and large, say peace now. That means uh, it's Israel's responsibility. It's, uh, if we do not have peace, it's because of us. And I guess as, as, as Jews, uh, maybe, you know, introspectively, we have been too much accustomed to blame ourselves before anything else. Uh, and the right, uh, I would say the reasonable right, says, well, we do want to have peace with the Palestinians. It's our interest to have peace with the Palestinians, but certainly not at any price, certainly not at the price of losing our country. And, and this is why we have to walk a very fine line. And to look for a, a solution which is reasonable, which is achievable. You know, coming here in, in the United States, uh, you say that uh, the enemy of the good is perfect. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that we will not have a perfect solution. And if we will keep looking for a perfect solution with the Palestinians, we will never find the good solution. And the good solution in my mind now, because of many reasons, is that uh, you cannot go for a, um, a final status agreement. The gaps are too big, the leadership is not uh, uh, there, so on and so forth, and of course the shifting grounds in, in the Middle East. Certainly you don't want to see another failed Arab states in the Middle East at this point. Uh, it will just aggravate things much, much uh, uh, further. And I can tell you now from speaking, of course, very confidentially with many Arab leaders and diplomats, the concern for them is not a Palestinian state, quite the contrary. For most of the Arab countries, a Palestinian state right now is, uh, is not a, an advantage, quite the opposite. Because uh, if there is a Palestinian state, and let's say against all odds, it is really democratic. That would, both, that, that would really mean that you know, Saudi Arabia, the Egyptian people also would want democracy, you know, if they will have a, an example in, in Palestine. But uh, what is more likely, that it will be a failed state, which will, uh, which will sponsor, which will export terrorism, furthering destabilizing the, the, the regimes, the, the, the Sunni or the fairly moderate regimes. So certainly it's not their concern. Uh, their concern is Iran, ISIS. Um, and I'm not sure that the Palestinians themselves are, are quite ready. I, I've seen it all along that more that they want to build their own state, they want to destroy ours. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't go just for Hamas or Islamic Jihad, the Palestinian Islam. I think it also uh, is very much the, um, the ideology of the Palestinian Authority. They may talk softly, more softly than Hamas, but judging by what they do, they are no different than them. So I think that Israelis have to come to grips with reality. Yes, we do need, we would like to have some sort of settlement. And uh, short of having a full peace, we have to have some kind of series of arrangements, which I think can be done. Um, we can make the situation win-win for both us and the uh, Palestinians. Give me an example. Okay, uh, I would say, if you look at the equation right now, what we need in Israel, we uh, need recognition as a Jewish state. Because? because you know, there are even Jews who argue, what do we care? <laughs> we'll define ourselves. Who cares if they define us? Yes. Uh, okay, I'll tell you what. I, I, I've had some uh, Palestinian um, diplomats trying to mock at me saying, why do you want us to recognize you as a, as a Jewish state? You don't know who is a Jew. You need us for affirmation. And I always say, listen, uh, we don't need rec Palestinian recognition of us as a Jewish state in Hebrew, not even in English. We need it in Arabic, mm -hmm. because this would really reflect a, the end of conflict, the end of their claims. This is why it is important for them to do. And it is very suspicious mark that they are so adamant against recognizing us as a Jewish state. What does it take away from them? Why, do they, why are they so insisting, insisting on not recognizing us as a Jewish state? Abu Mazen himself, supposedly the moderate and pragmatic, said more than once that in a thousand years they will not recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Why? You know why. Tell us why. 
Well, why is there? Because that they, they still believe in this, what we call the uh, stage theory, where first they claim Judea and Samaria, and then the Galilee, and then the Negev, and then the Sharon area. This is what they teach their children. And recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, that means that's the end of uh, their, their claims. And until and unless they do it, I don't see how we can really move forward in a way which will be, um, which will be a, a fundamental change in the, in, in, in the relationship, whereby we really go for historic reconciliations and peaceful coexistence. Because peace is not just a piece of paper. You know, we have to have a change of, of hearts and mindset and politics, and leadership, and education, and we do not see it yet. Okay, you explain it so well, and it seems to <laughs> me so obvious. Mm -hmm. But you hear people who oppose you. What do they say to you? What's the argument against your point that until the Palestinian is willing to say, yes, there can be a Jewish state, there will not be an end to the ultimate desire to have this land from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. But when you are ever in discussions with people who disagree with you, good people mm -hmm. in, in the state of Israel, what do they say to what seems to be such an obvious fact of life? What do they argue with you? Their main argument is that this is an obstacle that if we insist to do that, it's like yes, humiliating is, the final what did yeah. they have? Why would they make it a point? Why would they make it an issue? That's your point. Do they have any answer to that? No, uh, their answers or their arguments are not rational. They're more emotional. And trying to say also a Jewish state in a, reflects maybe a, um, a religious state it's anachronistic to define a nation or a nation state by religion. They don't do it anymore, which is Israeli not really the case. Say this? Some. But to that I say, listen, first of all, there are some states, even the, even the United Kingdom is defined as a Christian country. But this is beside the point. What I want to say is that we should understand that Judaism is not just a religion. It's much more than that. It's a way of life, it's traditions, it's history, it's, it's, a, it's a whole civilization. And it's ethnicity, certainly. Uh, and also, you know, they have a problem arguing with me because I show it, no, because I prove to them, not just in a, in a historic or moral way, but also in a legal way. And legality, you know, international relations, uh, maybe the first rule is reciprocity. And, uh, when Israel recognized the Palestinians' right for self-determination, the minimum they should accord us is the right for self-determination for us. And it so happens that we self-determine ourselves as Jews and the Jewish state. So for the Palestinians not to do that, and again, I, you know why, why we're so suspicious about it. And, and this is where I think the arguments from the other side stop. Okay. If there were a leadership in the Palestinian world which really, really wanted to live without conflict. Let's not even use the word peace. Mm -hmm. They were willing to live alongside the Jewish state of Israel without conflict. They were willing to make some compromise on their right of return. A certain number would be permitted based on an agreement they made. Other than that, done. Mm -hmm and they would curb terrorism, and they would change their textbooks, and there wouldn't be incitement. If all this happened, whether it's remote or not, if it happened, are you willing to live side by side in a two-state solution? Absolutely. 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 I argue the vast majority of Israelis say absolutely as yes. well. Yes. And then they say, but you're talking about a fantasy. Right. At the moment, you don't believe this is in the near future? Unfortunately not. Okay. The question that is asked of you, then Danny, what do you want to do in the meantime? Okay. Do you want a one-state solution? Do you want to annex the territory? What are you going to do with a population of X million? It's always, there's a debate at how many million of Palestinians literally live on the West By Bank. By the way, the Palestinians do inflate the numbers. I can tell you that. I understand. Yeah. But how many, it's, it, yeah, but, even if right, it's a million, it's right, a million. Right, okay, right. 
Do you want a million no. Palestinians no. incorporated into no. the polity of Israel? No. Okay. So what does Denny I alone okay. want to do in the meantime? Okay. If we understand, and you and I understand completely, mm -hmm. it's a human tragedy mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there's no Palestinian leadership that wants to make peace yeah. with Israel because Israel is right. ready. Right. But since they won't, what do you want to do in the meantime? Okay, so again, let's go back to the, to the basic elements of the conflict. And what does Israel need or want is recognition, I mentioned, as a Jewish state. By the way, here, you know, I was in Washington and I, I was one of the, let's say, the, uh, the ones that started the roadmap to peace, if you recall that, when, in when 2000, Bush was yeah, 2002. The what do you mean you helped start the well, roadmap? I was, well, we were, we were drafting it together with the, with the Americans, uh, uh, with the Europeans. You were behind it. You were, you were in favor of it, I mean. Oh, well, sure. Well, it was Sharon, his staff, ours, the Bush, Condoleezza Rice. We all worked together. You but had hope. We had hope. And the title of the Roadmap to Peace was the Roadmap to Peace of Two States for Two People. You don't hear for two people anymore. Again, I, I have tried to get Palestinians to go back to say two states, for, they, they do not say that. They say two state solution. What does it mean? Two Arab states, two Muslim states. That's also some, you know, this, this, and the rhetoric is very important here. So again, what do we need? We need recognition and security. What do the Palestinians ask for? Sovereignty and independence. So this is where we can, you know, do the, um, the, the exchange. And I would say that the, the um, extent of sovereignty would be the extent, which should be commensurate to the extent of their recognition or security. Since I do not see them recognize Israel as a Jewish state at this point, since I do not see them able to curb terrorism, we have to find something in between. So, for instance, one of the ideas which I, in a way, support is Let's have a Palestinian entity in where they are. You know, the, the, the Palestinians already occupy 100% of Gaza and about 40% of Judea and Samaria under the full uh, control of the Palestinian Authority. In this 40%, 98 of the Palestinians of the West Bank live. 98%? Yes, yes. So I would say that they can have, you know, I, I do not mind that they would have a flag and independence over where they are anyway. Independence? Air, yes. They can be a member Gaza state is, of the United Nations. Absolutely. Gaza is independent in well, a way. Well, you're creating a two-state solution then. Right. You're just defining where the borders are. Well, uh, at least on an interim basis. But you be willing to, to say you have your state. It's right now... Where you Ramallah, are anyway. Right. Nablus. And, and, right. Right. But we, is Hebron part of it? Well, some of, you know, the, the, Ara, the, the Arab the Hebron, Arab yes. Okay. But, but not Kiryat Arba okay. and not the Patriarch, yes, said. absolutely. Okay. Is there any chance the Palestinian world <laughs> leadership would accept that kind of notion? I'm afraid not. Then and why, again, then, it's not a, then it's not a solution. <laughs> well, there's not, uh, any, uh, well, at least we should put something on the table. Mm -hmm. At least we should put something on the table. You cannot really fight something with nothing. So when the entire world tell us the only solution is the 67 borders, uh, it is dividing Jerusalem, it's bringing in I don't know how many thousands of uh, descendants of Palestinians. Uh, they are not. They shouldn't be refugees anymore. You know, according to international law. Um, then I say no. This is not the only solution. There are other others as well. And again, since I do not see the Palestinians at this point recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, as I do not see them able of fighting with terror, I would say, let's freeze the situation. They have 100% of Gaza. They have 40%. They do have 40% of the West Bank. And I think this is a sizable uh, uh, amount of, of land where they can establish their own state demilitarized state as, uh, as we all envision. If this is the case, then, you know, they would have what they want. You already said they won't accept it. 
they will and then you said something very important. Even though you don't believe they would accept it, you think it's important for Israel to right. make the offer. Exactly. To put something on the table so we are not considered as the uh, intransigent or uh, the one that is not willing to, to, to move ahead. It's your fault, people say. Right. And you want to show, no, we're ready to make peace. Mm -hmm. And so here's another alternative. Right. What you're really saying, by the way, is we'll, make a, we'll have a two-state solution and here's the state. Mm -hmm. And you would like the Israeli government to make that offer? Yes. Okay. And if Benjamin Netanyahu were sitting next to you, he would say? I'm sure quietly he would say that's a great uh, thing. I'm not sure he would like to do it uh, publicly. Uh, he has his own opposition within the Likud party, not just the right-wingers. Right. And uh, probably politically he would be afraid to say that because there is a, a growing, I would say, growing sentiment in the Israeli right against this two-state two solution. And I can understand why, you know, the offers were made to the Palestinians, both in Camp David 2000 by Barak, and then Annapolis 2008 by Olmert, and we know the, the, the results and the answers of the Palestinians, yes. But having said that, I think that we should be innovative more when it comes to the political scene, uh, and we should be initiating, we should take a lead Otherwise, you know, we will be led by others. So this is why I think we have to be more creative when it comes to the diplomatic scene. Okay, again, you say it very, very well, and you do articulate what I hear those who lean left say. Yes, it may be that this is impossible, but Israel must put, must look, must it not look, must, Israel must always be working to try to find a solution. If the right. Palestinians say no every time, they say no. Right. Okay. And then what people say to me is, what you just referred to, there's a political reality in Israel as well. And you know, we're seeing crazy politics in America. There are crazy <laughs> politics in Israel. And people say that Netanyahu is a political being, and he has a right to be. He's, he's in the political world, right. and he has to do also what will enable him to survive. Every president, prime minister does that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's a, there are people who are terribly disappointed in him, who feel that he is not courageous enough in standing up to those in the Likud party and those in the Knesset as a whole who don't understand your vision and they want a stronger prime minister to stand up against it. Mm -hmm. What we also hear, and this is I want you to talk about, Israel has moved to the right. Many American Jews, like we know anything, you understand, Denny, most American Jews know nothing. And they think they know because they read the New York Times, which knows nothing. But it bothers American Jews because what they feel is that Israel, after the last election, mm -hmm. and then after certain policy decisions in the last mm -hmm. year, that the entire government is moving to the right, and you hear liberal Jews in America say, Gewalt, Gewalt, it's the end of Israel, because Israel was never meant to be a right-wing state. Mm -hmm. If anything, it was going to be a labor left-wing state. <laughs> but I want you to speak to what you feel the dynamic right mm -hmm. now is in, in Israel, in terms of, does Israel is Israel moving... It, are the people of Israel moving right? Has the government really moved to the right? And what's it mean to you? Because you, while you're a set, you, I define you as a centrist. Center-right, yeah. Okay. But you're not extreme. And you've already said uh, on L'chaim, yeah, you'd, you'd live with a two-state solution. You're not afraid to give back land. You just don't want to do we it. We gave stupid. already land. the land. We gave the land. Okay. And it doesn't bother you. You're, you're not staying. But it... You and I would both like it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if in, when the Messiah comes, all of Eretz Yisrael is <laughs> right. the Jewish state. Until the Messiah comes, you and I will live with mm -hmm. a compromise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's you. There are those who say, you know, Daniel alone, you've been left behind already because there's too much of a movement in mm -hmm. Israel to the right that excludes your position. I want you to analyze sure. for me where Israel is. 
Well, in general, Mark, I would say that in politics, nothing is etched in stone. Everything is very fluid, and it's a reflection of moves that uh, you know are, let's say, exogenic to the system. I can tell you that um, after Oslo, 1993, 75 to 80 percent of the population were pro-peace for two-state solutions. Why? Because they, they, they believe in hope. When Sadat came to Jerusalem to meet Begin in 1977, 90 of, percent of Israel was for, for Egypt. Before that, it was just the opposite. Israel moving to the right is only a reflection of the, 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 the feeling of, of betrayal from the Palestinian Intifada, you know, after the, what was offered to them, uh, from their position right now, from what's happening in Gaza, you know, giving Gaza with this disengagement, which was, you know, excruciatingly painful process in Israel. Uh, at that time, I was here in Washington, but in retrospect, I think it was a mistake. Uh, in any case, we gave Gaza, and what did we get? Just terror and more terror. In, so the people of Israel, you know, they are right there and they have all the right to, uh, to really feel the betrayal, not just from the Palestinians, but from the international community. Because when Sharon made this deal with President Bush of leaving Gaza, the understanding was that if there was one rocket from Gaza over Israeli population, you know, the, the response would be very, very harsh in a way that would really take care and take out the infrastructure of, of terror. This is that not the case. That was the deal with Bush? That was the deal with Bush. And what do we get? You know, we have been fired since the disengagement from Gaza. There were like more than 15,000 rockets fired on our population. We responded, and what happens? We get the Goldstone Report. They take us into the internet, try to take us into the international court. So certainly Israelis feel, well, if this is the case, well, we have to really be more tough and, uh, and, and forward-looking, uh, no more concessions to the Palestinians, unless and until, you know, we see a totally different uh, uh, policies and behavior from, from them. So this is quite understandable. But I guarantee you, Mark, if there was hope against hope, a Palestinian Sadat coming to Jerusalem mm -hmm. in the same demeanor, mm -hmm. immediately I can tell mm -hmm. you that the public mood would be changing over to the century. I think you're 100% correct. So you talk about symbolism and that it's important for Israel to constantly be making peace overtures even if you sadly believe they will not be reciprocated. Tell me how you feel about Israeli settlement policy. It's a huge deal here in America to American Jews. And I keep hearing different things and you know Part of opinion should be influenced by fact. Mm -hmm. You should know the facts, and then it can help you arrive at your own opinion. When the facts are murky, it's hard to arrive at a thoughtful, reasoned position. That's what I feel is happening at the moment when people talk in the Jewish community about the Israeli settlement mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. So I will hear people say, Danny... Israel does, you know, it does some building inside the existing settlement box, but the government is in no way sponsoring or validating any crazy settlement deep inside the West Bank. I hear other people say to me, what are you talking about? If Netanyahu wanted to stop it, he would stop it, and it's not being stopped. There are settlements being built, little ones here and there on the West Bank all the time, and these symbolically say to the world, and the Palestinians use it mm -hmm. to argue, the, the state of Israel is not serious about a two-state solution, because if they were serious about a two-state solution, they wouldn't be building settlements deep in the West Bank. So I'm asking you two questions. Number one, to the extent to which you know, what is Israel's settlement policy today. When I say Israel, I mean the government of Israel, the prime minister of Israel. What is their policy and what are they doing and how do you feel about it? Well, first of all, you know, 
I am not a spokesman for the government. I'm not part of this government. So I cannot tell you uh, in their name what they're doing. I'm not sure they know what they're doing. But in any case, I'll go back to the beginning. Jews have a fundamental right to live in any place in the West Bank. It's not a Juden right. Arabs live all over. You know, if you look at the, uh, the territory between the sea to the river, you know, Arabs can live anywhere, you know, in the Galilee, in the Negev. And, and so, so Jews should have this, to be accorded the same right. Having said that, we do understand that, you know, if and, and, and when there is a uh, political solution, then, of course, some adjustments will have to be made. So my point is that the settlement is not an issue at all. It's just sidetracking. I, I don't think, and the Palestinians, and, and I think this is the political victory of the Palestinians mm -hmm. over us. Mm -hmm. That they made, they made the settlement, the crux of the matter, which is not. Because if there is peace, the settlements will never be in the way. Uh, they say, well, uh, if Israel wants peace, uh, why do they build settlements? Well, settlements are not irreversible. We have proven it in, in Gaza. Uh, but so long as there is no peace or a chance of peace, the Jews, the Israelis who live in Judea and Samaria have all the rights to live and prosper and develop without any impediment. And, um, and that should not reflect on what any possible solution in, in the future. Part of the solution could be just as we have Arab, you know, I, I think that everybody knows that the major population blocks will always be part and parcel of Israel. Now, you're talking the about the, blocks, the settlement yeah. blocks, right. You're talking about the, the periphery. There, I believe, uh, in case there is a, a real peace, then probably they would have to have the choice whether to stay there or move over uh, to Israel. And again, just as they are Arabs, you know, by the way, be, being a Jewish state in Israel doesn't mean that non-Jews do not have all the rights, all the civil rights, all the political rights. Uh, so just as we have Arab Israelis, there could be some uh, Jews in whatever uh, entity that uh, will, will emerge. But the, a, again, my main point is we should not even discuss the, the issue of the settlements unless and until we do see a change of heart and mindset among the Palestinians, then it's, it's beside the point. The settlement is not the issue. Mm. I want to push you just a little bit. Okay. I personally don't disagree with one thing you've said. And I think people don't understand from the Palestinian perspective, the green line is irrelevant. They feel Palestinian land is on both sides of the green line. And when they say we're going to liberate Palestine, this was before the Six-Day War. They were talking about Haifa and Tel Aviv right. and your community, which is... Hoda Sharon, yes. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And from the Palestinian perspective, it's ironic. American Jews don't get it. Every time the American Jew or the Israeli makes a distinction between whether a Jew has the right to live on one side of the Green Line, meaning on the east side or on the west side of the Green Line, inside the Green Line or outside the Green Line. Every time a Jew makes that distinction, the Palestinian says, you see, it's all ours anyway. Hmm. The Jew wouldn't even be thinking of this uh -huh. if he didn't understand, that's my land on the other side of the uh -huh. Green Line. That Green Line's an accident of where the armistice line in 1949. It's an accident. Mm -hmm. It's not a... The United Nations, most people think the United Nations made that line. It's not a United Nations line. It's not a League of Nations. It's nothing. Palestinian says that line's nothing. The land, if you say, Jew, the land in the West Bank is Palestinian, I'm saying to you the land on the other side of the West Bank is Jews don't get it. Having said that, I am pushing you because you're the one who says to me. You're the only one I let pushing me. <laughs> okay. You're Beside sweet. my wife. You're sweet. Sometimes you do things even though you don't believe it because it has to be a symbol. It's a symbol, you said to me. I, I don't believe there's a Palestinian leadership that's going to make peace with Israel, but Israel has to keep offering. I'm asking you why it doesn't apply. It's not that you're wrong, 
but that the argument is it's a symbol and what you want to do for the international world the com international community is do things that are symbolic which get them off the Jew and the Israelis back if you're willing to say I want a peace I'll make a peace offer that I know is going nowhere why won't you say the same thing about the settlement policy? We have every right to live. We do. We have every. There's not a reason. There's not a moral reason and not a legal reason why Jews can't live anywhere in the West Bank. But it it's not about morality or legality. It may be it's stupid. Maybe it's just not wise. What do you answer? Well, here I take the point of view of the seven hundred thousand Israelis who live, you know, uh, in Jerusalem and the rest of Judea and Samaria. And they are the best and brightest. They were sent there by successive Israeli governments from left and right, labor and, uh, and, and Likud. And they certainly should not be uh, abandoned. Uh, today, I But believe, we're not abandoning. No, no, we're yeah, I know. But uh, no, in, in the sense that, you know, you know, if they build more housing, they need it. They need more classes. They need, need more People kindergartens. People stopped arguing about, about um, vertical buildings and building inside the settlements. The argument is new, totally new settlements. That's the argument you have to deal with. Well, the argument here, yeah, it, there is some, some point into it, but I would say that... Um, this was not any obstacle to peace. You know, the Palestinians were against uh, us, whether before there was even one settlement, as you know. And, and again, this is just an excuse. I say that the settlers, they call them, you know, the Jews today, the Israelis who live today in Samaria and, and Judea and Samaria are no different than the Israeli, the, the Jewish Halutzim. You know, we came in the first Aliyah, the second Aliyah, at the end of the... Nine, 19th century, 20th century, building the land. Yeah. And they were the leaders. They are the elites. And, uh, and, and this is why I think what, what they're doing is something which is sacred. Again, not to say that if peace comes uh, on earth, I'm sure that a solution will be, uh, will be found. But unless and until, I don't think that Israel should change one iota its, um, its settlement policy, okay. and in a way. If the Palestinians are so concerned, you know, about this, this land or peace, I think that this should have been an inducement for them to come into the table. Mm -hmm. But for them, it's all or nothing still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all or nothing approach, uh, I believe they will end up with nothing. Yes. By the way, you and I believe all or nothing refers to what? To the entire land. Right. Not the West Bank. Not the West Bank. Yes. The entire land. Yes. I don't know if I've ever asked you this before. I may have. I don't care. I want to hear your answer today. Why doesn't the United States government understand what you understand? Why doesn't the United States State Department, the White House, why don't they understand what Israel is up against as simply as you've described it? And you were in Washington. You were a senior world diplomat mm -hmm. in Washington. You got to know these guys. Mm -hmm. Tell us why. How, how is it that what is so clear gets no recognition inside the American administration, State Department, and White House? Well, again, it's, it's politics. Uh, you, you have 22 Arab countries. You have 22 American ambassadors versus one ambassador in Israel. They get all these reports from the other side's uh, perspective, and it's very convenient, you know, to really lean on the one democratic state which they can really um, converse with than uh, with the other side. It's just a matter of convenience, idea, you know, uh, some um, what we call idea fixes, you know, it's uh, uh, not thinking out of the, uh, out of the box. And the, the pressure, certainly it was in the 70s, the pressure from okay. the oil countries and it's all that. It's not anti-Semitism in your life? Not, 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 certainly not in the United States. In Europe, maybe, but certainly not in the United States. Um, this is okay. not the case. You talked about the truth about Israel and Hasbara, which means 
it's a hard word to describe. It's often translated as public relations. Right. It's not public relations. It's really trying to educate people about the right. truth about Israel. Right. And you're very much involved in Hasbara. You also are very sensitive to a reality that's facing world Jewry and it's facing American Jewry, especially on college campuses, the BDS movement. I want you to talk for a moment about the extent to which the BDS movement you feel is a real threat to the Jewish people and the state of Israel. To what extent is it overblown, if it is at all? And what are your concerns, and why are you working so hard in that area? I'll tell you. First of all, I don't think it's overblown. I think it's a real strategic threat. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians, uh, since they have failed to uh, win on the battleground, or they, with the economic boycotts, they go to this political field. I mean, it's just a change of tactics, but the goal is still the same, the destruction of the state of Israel. BDS uh, is a tool of the Palestinians. Ba Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 2005, when it was uh, founded by uh, this Perguti, the mission, the, 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 the mission statement of BDS is to the destruction of the state of Israel. And this is where I, I really argue with our fellow Jews, brothers and sisters, that uh, I, I feel they're misguided. Uh, I certainly don't want to turn against them. You know, they are not the enemy. The enemy are the Palestinians or the Iranians or the terrorists. Certainly not uh, um, uh, J Street or I, I would like them to change. I think we need a dialogue, but I think they must understand that they are being used by uh, the Palestinians, by the detractors of the State of Israel. And I don't think that the BDS would have too much of a gain without Jewish support. And this is very, very unfortunate. Ironic also. But I want to make the point here that the BDS today here in the United States trying to emulate the Palestinian strategy in Europe. What the BDS does today, or in the last 10 or so years in the United States, is what the Palestinians have been doing in Europe for the last 40 years. 40 years ago, Israel was not a pariah state in, the, in, in Europe. Today, just a public opinion poll in, in Europe, country, uh, you know, rating countries, Israel comes fourth from the bottom. Iran is more popular in Europe than Israel. The only three countries be, be behind us were North Korea, Pakistan, and uh, North Korea. Uh, and why is it? Because of the bombardment of BDS type activities in Europe for the last 40 years. It has been successful to some extent. Absolutely. It started with the fringe groups, esoteric, and then it comes into the mainstream. And this is what I fear about the United States. Here, because I, I see the same process. It starts with fringe groups. It could be maybe Presbyterian Church. It could be some academic um, um, you know, groups, like uh, the Association of um, uh, professors for you know, American studies, professors and others. But if we do not nip it in the bud, if we do not confront it, if we just look the other way, as we did unfortunately in Europe, it will become the mainstream. And we cannot afford losing the United States. And this is what the Palestinians do. They have already gained in Europe. Of course, the Muslim world and Arab world is in, in their pocket. Russia, others. And where do they, where is the big price? Is the United States. And this is why they work so hard here. And this is why, unfortunately, we have Jewish groups who support them. And I don't understand why. You know, there are so many detractors of the state of Israel. Why should they join? I mean, there, there, there should be more, more than Jewish solidarity. It's just a matter of survival. It's just a matter of common sense. And this is where uh, I hope we will see change of hearts. We have to keep trying. Again, fighting the BDS and also try to bring the Jewish organizations on board with us. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to either college students or the parents of college students, college students who have to face this, and parents of college students who are worried their children have to face this. What advice, and you speak about this now all the time, and uh, Naomi Vilko is here with us, and she's fighting Naomi this all the time. Naomi is a great friend. Yeah. Unbelievable. 
and a great supporter of the truth about Israel. Yes, and she I is. wish we would have more people like her, exactly. leaders in their communities. Exactly. So, what would you tell first the kids, and what would you tell their parents? First and foremost is speak up. Don't be afraid to speak up. And in order to speak up, you have to be confident about the facts. So you have to understand and learn the history and the facts. This is why, you know, the truth about Israel is trying to really make all the, the information available in a very, very uh, simple way. And uh, once they understand uh, the, the history and, and the facts, I don't think anyone who can, with his right mind and, and with his, you know, right morality, would side with the BDS. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of misinformation. There is a lot of uh, anti-Israeli propaganda. And some fall for it. And why do they fall for it? Because they do not know the facts. So first and foremost, learn the facts. And then be confident, be proud about your Judaism, be proud about the state of Israel. Yes, we are not perfect. I don't know of any state which is perfect. But certainly we are trying and... Uh, and the destiny, there is one destiny for Jews and Israel. It's one and the same. We must understand that. You know how much I love you. <laughs> You're fabulous, just Thank fabulous. Kol Tuvo Haslacha, you just keep doing the work. I want to Thank show you. as much of the stuff that you do on JBS as I can. And I want you in this chair every time you're around. Absolutely. Fair enough. I love you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, David. And Beautiful. Remember, I'm Israel Chai. I'm Israel Chai. Beautiful. There you have it, the thoughts of Denny Ayalon, who was the ambassador for the State of Israel to Washington and a deputy foreign, uh, foreign minister in, in the State of Israel. And he, as you hear, he is fighting the good fight. And he has many important things to say to us. You don't have to agree with everything Denny says. But what he does do is help us think through the issues. And of course, as always, I invite any of you who would like to make a comment in response to anything you've heard on this edition of L'Chaim, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. My thanks on this special edition of L'Chaim to Naomi Vilko, who does fabulous work on behalf of the Jewish people, the State of Israel, and she is an enormous defender of Holocaust survivors, who are sometimes treated very shabbily by world Jewry. And she is one of the voices that speaks out. She speaks out. Izzy Liebler speaks out. And it's always wonderful to hear what she has to say. And she makes sure so much of what is happening in JBS, including this guy here, who is a dear friend, is heard as often as possible all over the United States. That's the program for this week. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.